Hello all. Hopefully everybody can hear us. We have gone through some testing with Rob Shaplan, who will be our uh, presenter for today. So you guys all will be in the mute status and I just would like to set up some expectations before we're going to start um, this uh, great presentation on the red teaming where Rob will be simulating a real criminal attack, which will be very exciting. And I can see we are here with the big numbers. So if you do have any questions, I would like to kindly ask you, please do um, use the question in, in your in your go to webinar uh, presentation mode and just write the questions. I will be managing that. We have agreed with Rob as well that we will be answering all the questions after. So we do not disrupt his story because to be honest, I have heard it previously and it's amazing. It's really entertaining. So we are very honored to have Rob with us. So um, on that note, uh, we are one minute um, away. So if anybody has anything to grab a tea or a coffee or anything, please do that because you will be swamped for the next 45 minutes to one hour under the magic of Rob. And I believe you will not be able to leave. So Rob, if you wanna greet our attendees as well, and we will be shortly starting because it's 6.30 and we like to keep on time. Sure. Yeah, so I think, I think Rob, um, no questions whatsoever right now. Okay. Um, I do have a question here from the Smith Rob. Can you please let us know what is happening? So we just um, just to answer um, this question is that we are starting at the 630. So that's why we, you guys have been in the waiting mode because that's when we officially started. Even we just wanted to make sure that everybody has possibility to register and over to you, Rob. Thank you so much for uh, coming to this our online event and we are very honored to have you. So thank you so much, Rob, and off to you. Perfect, okay. Thanks very much, uh, Susanna. Um, hi everyone, um, like half the world at the moment, I've got a bit of a cough, so apologies if I uh, if I keep coughing, I'll try my best not to, I've got a glass of water next to me, so it should be okay. Um, before I kick off with the presentation itself, I will introduce myself. Um, my name is Rob Shapland. Um, I work as Head of Cyber Professional Services, which doesn't really mean anything to anyone, uh, for a company called Phalanx Cyber, based in the UK, down near Brighton. Um, my job basically is a mix of different things. So I run a team of uh, penetration testers, and there's about 15 of us. Um, I also do security awareness training for companies. So I go in, you know, once, we're, once we're all released into the world, I go into companies and help train staff on um, basic security awareness stuff. Um, but the main part of my job and that I really have fun with is, is social engineering and, and red teaming. So that means simulating criminal attacks on companies. And that's what I'm, I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, I've been doing this job for, well, it must be 13 years now. Um, started off on the technical side of hacking. So learn how to hack um, computers, applications, mobile phones, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then moved from there into the social engineering side, which is hacking people. So uh, using psychological te techniques, influence, etc., to try and um, bypass security controls by convincing people to do things uh, on your behalf. Um, and red teaming is what we moved into from there, which is kind of a combination of the two. It's basically allowing almost any form of attack on a company. And I'll talk you through a bit more about what that is shortly. Um, when I'm not doing those things, uh, I do a bit of writing for, for various magazines, especially in the US. Um, and I do a little bit of, um, sort of media work for BBC, ITV, that sort of thing. And in my spare time, I like to do things like obstacle course racing and stuff that just doesn't happen at the moment. Um, so I'm going out for my one run a day for an hour, um, zigzagging across the roads, doing that thing where you're trying to avoid people and not get within two meters of them and make it into a game where you're trying to sort of zigzag between people. Um, so that's my entertainment at the moment. Um, so what I want to talk you through in this session is red teaming. I'm going to do it in the form of a story. I'm basically going to tell you about a place that I broke into um, to make it a bit more entertaining. Um, now, if you haven't heard of red teaming before, it it's basically means um, anything goes, more or less. So normally when you when you contact a company to do a, do a penetration test, a security review, you do individual parts of the company. So you might do a website, you might do uh, their office, you might do a new computer they've built. Red teaming is a bit different in that you just, <coughs> you give the company that's targeting you just your company's name, basically, and you say what you want them to achieve. Um, so it might be, you know, we are Tesco's and we want you to 
break into our head office and steal a database full of all our club card customers, something like that. Something that's really, really important to you that would be huge and damaging if it got out. You get the good guys, us, to, to break in, and then we tell you how we did it because we simulate the same techniques the real criminals use. Uh, and then you go from there and you fix those and then you do it again and you fix those issues and you do it again. You just keep repeating round and round and round again. It's a really effective way of, of stopping real criminal attacks. And what we do is we look at the company that we're targeting and we decide what level of sophistication to use against them. So if we're targeting like a military installation, that's going to be a different class of criminal or, or foreign intelligence service that's going to target that place. So they tend to be quite good. Um, Apart from that, if we're targeting a small office, so let's say uh, like a head office building in London of an insurance company, you've got a slightly different level of, of threat. And if you're targeting a charity, another different level of threat. So we try and simulate um, the right threats for that company. Uh, and we do a whole process of, of sort of chatting to them and working out what those threats are. Um, now, red teaming, as I said, is kind of anything goes. So within reason, with certain things I can't do when I'm when I'm doing red teaming attacks. So what I can do is I can walk into the building dressed as a as an engineer or a lift technician or whatever else. I love to do that. My favourite outfit at the moment, slight tangent, is um, plant watering guy. Um, so lots of companies, especially big companies, who have lots of pot plants around the building, will um, employ companies to come in and water those pot plants because there's so many around the building they don't want to use internal stuff. Um, so I just find out the, the company they're using by going, going the day before and, and, and sort of observing who comes and goes. Uh, print out a t-shirt in that style and design and then go in uh, dressed as the plant watering guy. Um, and you tend to get access to everywhere because you need to get access to all the rooms. So they give you a card that gets you more access than you would get from being an employee. Um, so that's a really, really good one at the moment. I'm, if, I, if I have enough time, I might tell you uh, the, the story about one when I used it. Um, so yeah, we, certain things we can't do. So I can't go in and like pull fire alarms. I can't fo phone in bomb threats. I can't, I can't kidnap someone and, and force them to open the doors and things like that. I've got to be within the realms of the law, um, but I do get people to sign a consent form saying you are allowed to do this uh, within, within those sort of parameters. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the rough, plan of red teaming. Uh, it's also really, really good fun. Uh, all the planning and execution, and how you sort of come up with how you're going to break into these companies is really good fun. Um, so this this um, presentation is going to be a story of, of a company that I did. Now I've changed a couple of facts. So you can't work out who the company are, um, but the rest of the story is absolutely as it happened. Um, so we've intro, the company was a pharmaceutical company. Uh, so big, big um, pharmaceutical company that um, I'm incredibly worried about people breaking into their company. By breaking in, I mean hacking in or physically breaking into their building and then stealing stuff. Um, big pharmaceutical company, now they have designs for new drugs that they're developing and they spend millions upon millions on those drug designs uh, and they have the, the sort of blueprints and designs on their computer systems. Now, those designs are worth a huge amount of money on the dark web, on the, on the black market. If they were to be stolen and then put on there, you know, that's a huge damage to that company. They might have spent you know, 100 million pounds developing those drugs and now that design has been stolen. They've lost the patent and it goes out to all the other companies and then you know, other countries can produce it for, for really cheap. Um, so they contact companies like mine to, to try and do these red team exercises to steal these designs. And that's what this one was. The, the objective was to get into two of their offices and get onto their computer network and uh, steal the designs for the drugs and also to get into one of their physical laboratories in their head office and photograph uh, and various things within there uh, and get unaccompanied access. Um, so there's two objectives, get on the computer network, get into the head office and uh, get photographs of us unaccompanied next to, to various things. Um, so the first thing we do, uh, this is the first slide, uh, is information gathering. So this is where you just basically sit in your computer and you find out as much information as you can about the company just by searching the internet. It's called open source intelligence gathering, uh, and it constitutes a quite a large part of the test. Um, so, you know, very simple things. You Google the company's name, you look at their website, you, you start to look through there and you see whether they've posted any photographs of their head office. Perhaps there's a uh, recruitment page where there's people, uh, employees photographed, and maybe you can see their ID badge. And now perhaps you come up with an idea of maybe I could be an employee and I could put that, I could make my own copy of that badge with my face on it. And I could turn up at the office and pretend to be an employee. Maybe that'll be enough uh, to get me in the building. Um, I'm also going to go to Google Maps. and I'm going to see where those buildings are physically located. And then I'm going to go into street view mode, the little orange man that you can pick up and drop on the map. 
uh, and I'm going to find out from there. I'm going to walk around uh, the various offices and have a look and see which one looks the least secure. Because there's no point in me targeting somewhere that looks really secure with fences and CCTV and stuff like that if I can just walk into one that, that that's far easier uh, to go into. Um, I will look at their what we call their internet facing presence. That is the the IP addresses that the computers they have pointed out to the internet, I could target with, with cyber attacks. Um, and also I'm looking for websites that they have. So could I target those with, with website based uh, cyber attacks to break in? Um, now I'm gonna go on to social media. So most companies will operate corporate social media pages. So the company will usually have an Instagram account, a Twitter account, maybe a Facebook account as well. And now I can go through those. And those are used for advertising the company, what they're doing. And often there's photos in there that are really useful. So photos from within the company's office, or again, with employees. You know, we did this charity event today. Um, here's a photo of us all um, after it. And you've got photos of employees and you zoom in, you can see the ID badge. And again, you can uh, use that to pretend to be an employee. The really useful stuff like that. We can then go from there, depending on how much time we have, we can start to go into more depth. We can go to LinkedIn and we can look up the names of the employees that work there. So you just type in the company name and it says, see all however many employees that work there. You click on that, it just gives you a huge list of the, of the people that work there. Now I can take those names and then go to their social media accounts, their Instagram, their Twitter, their Facebook pages, start scrolling through again, looking for pictures from inside the office, ID badge designs, um, any particular hobby or interest they're into, maybe I can target them with a phishing attack uh, directly to do with that. Uh, so this company, um, that we're targeting this pharmaceutical company, uh, 15 offices around the UK. So a reasonable size company, um, dotted all around uh, the UK. Um, they've got a few different websites. They've got some, some IP addresses, and computers pointed out to the internet. Um, I found out they're using OWA, which is called um, Outlook Web App. It's a way of accessing your email remotely when you're out of the office. Uh, and it's also a really good way of, uh, um, of hacking into companies. Uh, we went onto LinkedIn, found 400 people that worked there. Now, the great thing about LinkedIn is it tells me who you are and where you work. It's not gonna be difficult for, from there for me to work out what your work email address is. It's gonna be probably firstname.lastname at companyname.com. So now I've got the full list of 400 email addresses. So now perhaps I can start designing an email I can send to all those people to trick them into to clicking on some link and giving me a password that I can then use somewhere down the line. Um, I also sent some emails into the company, just some generic emails saying, um, I'm looking for a new job. Have you got any positions going? They then reply to that and say, you know, look at our website here. But what I'm doing is I'm grabbing the format of the email, uh, the style, the design, the font they use, so that then if I want to pretend to send an email that looks like it's come from internally within the company, I've now got the right style and design for it. Um, okay, so we, once we've built up this sort of suite of information about the company, so we know they've got 15 offices around the UK. Um, I know from that I have to target the head office because that's where all the labs are. I've been told that in advance. So that one's a given. I have to go for that one, which unfortunately is the hardest one to break into from the looks of it. Um, but also I can target a branch office. And of the 14 other offices, one of the branch offices looks really easy. I'm going to be honest, it's on a high street in a small town. And the great thing about it being on a high street is it can't have CC, well, it can have CCTV, but it probably won't be outward facing. Um, it can't have security patrols. It can't have fences, that sort of thing. Plus you can walk past it as many times as you want because you're just shopping. So it's really easy to, to have a look around. Um, so that's the one we're going to go for. Um, now this small branch office, when you, when you walk past it, uh, there's, a, there's a window you can see inside and there's just a reception desk uh, with a receptionist behind it. Uh, there's a lift behind her, which I presume probably goes up to some office space on the top floor. Uh, then there's a, a foyer area with some sofas and things, sort of standard small office type uh, arrangement. Uh, it's also a multi-tenanted building, so there are other companies in there and things as, as well. Um, the head office, a little bit different, uh, very secure, high fences, uh, CCTV cameras, looks like security patrols, um, all sorts of things. Um, so we do go there next and we do what we call on-site reconnaissance. This is a bit like you see in the movies when you do a stakeout and you get people eating donuts and they're sat in a car and they're, they're looking at what's going on. Um, and we get there at about six or seven in the morning and we stay there all day. So we try and find a coffee shop across the road or if we can just sit in a van and see what's going on, we'll do that. And we're looking for various things, various ways we can use to break into these buildings. Um, so one of the things you might be looking for is different entrances and exits. Is there a back door? Is there a smoker's entrance that we can just walk in and, uh, and get in that way? Um, where are the CCTV cameras? Can we, can we avoid those? 
Uh, what do the staff wear when they go to work? Uh, is it casual clothes? Is it smart clothes? Is it, um, is it some sort of uniform? Uh, do they have an ID badge? If they do, and we haven't managed to find the design of it from our um, on-site, from our um, open source intelligence gathering, we'll take a photograph of that ID badge uh, as someone walks past. I've then got an, a machine in my office that can print out badges and lanyards, any style and design that I need. So now I can make a copy, perhaps pretend to be an employee. Even better, if I can get within about half a meter of the person that's wearing the ID badge, so perhaps they go out to lunch, I follow them. I've got a device called an RFID cloner that will copy their badge. Uh, and make uh, a kind of a, a copied version of it. So the machine can now unlock any security doors, but it looks a bit weird if you use the sort of big, big bit of electronics to unlock the security doors. So instead, what I tend to do is I go back to the office, I take the signal that I've stolen into this machine, transfer it onto a sort of fake badge that I've created that's a, a, an ID card, and now that badge will work. So now I've got an ID badge that's in the right style and design, and it looks it looks completely legitimate and it works on the security systems that's the ideal scenario and that works brilliantly when you're targeting large offices when you have lots and lots of people working there it doesn't work when you have about 20 people working in the office because you can't pretend to be an employee you know imagine i don't know how many people work at your office imagine you've got 20 people working there and i just walk in and sit down and pretend i've always worked there it's not going to work very well but if you imagine the head office of a large supermarket or something there might be 2,000 people working there once you're past security, you are trusted. You know, as long as you don't act weird and do weird stuff, you are you are trusted. Um, so with that in mind, you can't do it at this branch office because there's only 20 people working there. So from observing what's going on, I can see people coming back and forth from lunch, going in in the morning, leaving in the afternoon. You can't just walk in pretending to be an employee. So we have to come up with a with another idea of, of how we're going to, to, to break in. Um, so we decide what we want to do is we want to send a phishing attack to people that work there. So that is an email tricking people into to clicking on a link and putting in a username and password. And the reason I want to do that in advance of the test is that when I get to the office, when I break in, when I pretend to be someone and get onto their computer network inside the office, I want to have a password of a real user straight away. Because then it makes it really simple. Because all I do is sit down at a computer and log on as that person. If I don't have a password, I've got to do a load of cyber attack hacking stuff. So it's really quite difficult and quite time consuming. And it's the last thing you want to do when you're in an office nefariously, when you're not supposed to be there. You want to be in and out as quickly as possible. Um, so the best way to do that is to do a phishing attack. Uh, so what we decide to do is to pretend to be um, someone from their IT department. Um, so we're going to um pretend to be their it department sending an email to the whole company saying we're switching over to a new version of microsoft outlook from next week uh, please could you check your username and password work on the following link and then we buy a, a domain a website address that looks really similar to their real address but what we do is we put a hyphen in the middle or we say something like it dash company name.com and you can buy those online you go to GoDaddy or 123 Reg or whatever company and buy those websites for just a few pounds and now you go to their real outlook page and you make a copy of it um, and you put it onto this new website that you bought now we need to target all these people with an email but we've got the email addresses if you remember I stole them from LinkedIn so I just worked out, I looked at who works there, I converted those names into email addresses by just guessing what the format's gonna be. So I had 400 email addresses I could send, send them to. Um, so now I can send out this phishing attack, pretending on the IT, IT department, asking people to click on this link uh, to upgrade to the new version uh, of Microsoft Outlook. Um, so I sent this out, um, sent it in three groups of 100, targeted 300 people. Um, and I talked to people that worked in that branch office as well as people in the, in the wider company. Um, now within, you know, just a few minutes, just a few seconds in some cases, people clicked on that link and they put in their password to, my, to the fake website. Now, because I control that website, I receive those passwords. It may look legitimate to them. And when they entered that password, I just sent up a message saying, uh, thank you for checking your username and password work. Um, all good to go. Um, so now I've got those passwords. I've got the passwords of 41 people who entered the credentials. Now, you don't need 41 passwords. You know, I was just after one, to be perfectly honest. Um, the really good thing is that the head off at the, um, the person who managed that branch office was one of the people that logged in. Uh, so I'm hoping he's going to have access to a nice lot of juicy things that, that I can that I can use. Um, so I remember the objective is to get onto the computer network and steal plans, blueprints for, for drug designs. 
So now being armed with a username and password of someone who probably has access to those, it's a really, really good start. Now all I've got to do is break into that office, get onto that computer network and then get away without getting caught while I'm there. Um, so we need to come up with a plan of how we're gonna break into this small branch office. I reject the idea of pretending to be an employee because there's only 20 people working there. Like I said, it's gonna be really suspicious. So what I want to do is come up with a pretext. This is a social engineering term. It basically means what you're gonna dress up as and how you're gonna act. And social engineering is much more like acting. When I say social engineering, I mean breaking into the building physically, going there, pretending to be someone, getting onto the computer network. Um, I work with a, a small team of, of social engineers. That is our, our, our job, is to break into buildings. Um, so you've got me who can do the technical stuff. Um, I've got a, an ex-Special Forces guy who's really good for breaking in uh, to, to hard to reach places and military installations, that sort of thing. And I also have an actress uh, who is perfect for this. Um, she's quite small, looks really innocent. Um, but of course, because she's an actress, she can act as any role that we want her to. So we can make her pretend to be a cleaner or, or whatever else. Uh, now for this role, I want to be the one that broke in because I needed to get onto the computer network and I've got the technical skills once I'm on there. Um, now I need to get onto the computer network, which means picking a pretext, a person I want to pretend to be, that matches what I need to do. So for example, I could dress as a plant watering guy and go around spraying all the pot plants, but I'm going to look really suspicious when I crack out a laptop and start working away on their network. However, if I choose to be a telecoms engineer, maybe that will work better instead. Um, and I use this one quite a lot because it doesn't look dodgy when they connect into the computer network. Uh, so I've got a, a high-vis yellow jacket for a very well-known telecoms company, um, which I'll probably say the name of by mistake in a minute. Um, I, I've got the, the high-vis jacket that I've just printed the logo on the back of. I've got a clipboard with some work reference documents that I've created uh, with the logo and everything. Um, I've got a... Um, what else have I got? I've got a box full of tools and cables and things like that that you can use. Um, but most importantly, I've got an ID badge. Uh, and I got this ID badge um, online. I went onto to LinkedIn and searched for the company's name, found some engineers that work for that company. I was looking for someone with a bit of a weird name so I could find them on Instagram and Twitter and those sorts of things. Uh, found one with a weird name, looked him up on Instagram, found his Instagram account, and he didn't have the private account option set. So I could see all the information uh, on his account. So now I scrolled through all his photos, went back a couple of years, hoping for a photo of him in his uniform, found one, it's it perfect, there's a picture of him in his full uniform holding his badge up to the camera. Uh, and it just said, um, first day at uh, the company, uh, so proud. So absolutely perfect for me. I can zoom in on that image, um, print out that badge with my machine, and now I've got a very valid looking ID badge. If anyone questions me, I've got the ID badge, I've got the paperwork, I've got the tools, I've got the high vis jacket. As long as I act like an engineer, should be fine. Um, so got all that stuff ready to go. So what I do is I walk into the office, into this office. Remember what I said, it has a reception desk, a lift behind it, and then a sort of foyer area. I go in and go straight to the reception desk, just acting really relaxed and go, um, hi, I'm here from, for, from the, the telecoms company. Um, I've got a, I've had a call uh, to come in and resolve a network issue for you. Um, there's been some sort of uh, network problem. Your head office have called us up and asked, uh, they said they can't contact you at all at the moment. So we're going to need to send me up to, to, to run some diagnostic checks and see if I can work out what's going on. Should take no more than about 30 minutes uh, to do that. Do you mind if I just, just run upstairs straight away? Um, hoping that she would just let me in on, on the back of that sort of convincing um, uh, dialogue. Um, however, she doesn't. She follows procedure and she says, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't have anything written down in our guest book for you today. I'm going to need to check with someone that you're supposed to be here. Um, have you got a contact name from your head office? Uh, now, as part of the preparation for the test, I'd, I'd prepared for this eventuality. So I looked down at my paperwork and went, yeah, there's this guy called Adam from your head office. And I, I passed her the, the sheet of paper. And he said, oh, OK, um, I'll, I'll give him a call. And she looked him up on their internal phone system. Now, there's a reason I chose Adam on purpose. And it's because Adam is out of the office and he's actually on holiday. And the reason I know that is because I've gone through his social media accounts. Uh, and I've gone onto his Facebook page on the morning of the test, um, and he's uh, posted up a Facebook status, and I can see that because he's not configured his privacy settings properly, uh, and it says, uh, at Gatwick Airport, uh, flying to Antigua. He's checked in uh, at Gatwick. So I know he's not going to be accessible on the phone that morning. So my hope is if she does ask me for a contact name, as she does, I can say that guy's name, she'll phone him up, won't be able to get a hold of him. Maybe then I can just convince her how important it is, and she'll just let me in, she'll kind of give up and, and let me in anyway. 
Uh, so she goes away. She tries to phone the guy up, can't get hold of him, leaves him a couple of voicemails. Comes back to me and says, look, I'm really sorry, but I can't can't get hold of Adam. Um, there's nothing I can do. I can't let him in without speaking to him. Can't let you in without speaking to him. But I, I, I've I, got loads of other things to be doing. I can't just keep on phoning this guy. I've got a really busy morning. Um, here's his phone number from our internal system. Would you mind giving him a call? If you do get hold of him, would you just put him through to me and I'll check it's all right for, for you to come in. Um, so I thought, okay, I can work with this. She's kind of given me control of this situation. So I go away, I wait a few minutes and I phone up my office and say, which one of you guys wants to be, pretends to be Adam? Because chances are she's not going to know his voice. He's from the head office. She's probably not going to know him. Um, so could you pretend to be Adam and then phone up and convince her uh, that you are? Uh, so he says, yes, he phones up the front desk directly um, and, and, and says, oh, hi, it's Adam here from IT. Have you got an engineer there with you? And I come back into the foyer at that point. She says, oh, yeah, he's just come back in. Uh, and fake Adam says, oh, OK, well, we're going to need to get this going straight away. We've got this huge network problem at the moment. We don't know if the problem's your end or our end or what the issue is, really. But we need to get this going straight away. Um, would you mind letting him in? Uh, and she says, oh, OK, yeah, that's fine. Um, it's good, good if I got a hold of you. Um, I'll get him in straight away. Uh, so she puts the phone down and she brings me over the guest book to sign in. So I just sign in with a fake name and... Uh, uh, and, and my company name and stuff like that. I'm just about to go up in the lift and she says, no, 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 hold on there for a minute. I'll call down our IT person to help you out. Now this completely throws me because there's about 20 people working in this office. I did not expect them to have their own dedicated IT person working in that office. And of course I want to hack their network. So the last thing I want is an IT person to be sat with me because they're gonna know what's going on. Secondly, of course, I've made up the network problem and he's an IT person, he's probably gonna know that. So I think at this point, I'm probably done. It's probably not going to work, but I'll stay and I'll see. I'll see what's happening. Um, so I wait around for a couple of minutes. The IT person comes down um, and he says he comes over to me and he says, "Look, I don't really understand why you're here. I've been using the network fine all morning. I've just run up some of my own diagnostic tools. Um, there's no, there's no problem." Um, I was just about to try and argue my way, but the receptionist steps in for me and does it, does it all for me. She says, "No, no, it's okay. I've spoken to Adam at head office." Uh, he says it's absolutely fine for the guy to come in. They don't even know if the problem's this end. It might be the head office end, but he's been sent over here first. And BT have some specialist tools that we don't have access to. She's just repeating everything we tell, told her, basically. Um, so he just shrugs and says, oh, OK, fine. Well, if you've spoken to Adam, that's you know, that's OK with me. I, I, I trust Adam. I know Adam well. Um, do you want to come up with me? Uh, and he takes me in the lift uh, and he apologises. and said, look, I'm really sorry for being a bit aggressive with you you know we have to be quite careful here we've got some quite sensitive data stored in our network we have to we have to look after it um and we get to the lift the top of the lift and the doors open uh, and, and he says i'm gonna say the company name now he says the, the weird thing is we don't even use bt here um but but come in anyway um so despite the fact that they don't even use the company um he lets me in it's the great thing about using that company um he sits me down at a desk now this desk this office area is actually really small it's cramped and it's small and it's the last thing you want as a hacker is to be surrounded by people while you're hacking the network. And um, so I need to get myself some space. I said, what am I, I going to do? Uh, and he sits down next to me and says, like, what do you need to do? Um, and I said, well, I've got to plug into your network. So he gives me a network cable to plug in. He says, is there anything else you need? Uh, I said, well, I, I could do with a cup of tea. Actually, can I, do, can I have a cappuccino? A bit random. I thought it might take him a few minutes to make a cappuccino. Um, have you got the bits for that? And he said, yeah. Yeah, a bit weird, but yeah, um, I've got the bits for a cappuccino. Uh, so he goes away and makes me cappuccino, and I'm frantically getting everything ready. Now, because I've already got a username and password, I can now log on using that. Now, I don't know how technical people who are, uh, are listening to this, but I'll just briefly run through what you do. Um, so you plug into the network, you get an IP address, or a, 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 a sort of position on the network, um, using something called DHCP, which gives you an IP address. Uh, now you find out the domain controller, which is like the, the main computer, almost like if you imagined a, a beehive, it's like the queen bee within that beehive. Um, and we log on to that and there's a command to find what that domain controller is. You log on using the username and password that you found and now you have access to that domain controller. Now domain controllers don't tend to actually store anything particularly sensitive, but what they do have is something called logon scripts, which is a sort of a set of information that tells you when someone logs on, what network drives they have access to and where those are. Now, those network drives are often the main file servers, which is where you go and log on to to retrieve all the information that you do to do all your work day in, day out. Now, you might use SharePoint nowadays. This was uh, about, about a year or so ago. I did this, uh, maybe two years ago, I did this um, with this tech. And most people were using sort of on-premise computers to store their information. So now I can log into this domain controller. I can find out the information on there. 
to find out where the file server is. Now I log into the file server and now I have access to everything in the company. I've got all that juicy information that I wanted to get access to. Um, now the guy comes back to me with cappuccino at this point. I'm just about to start searching through this information. Uh, and he says, look, I'm really sorry. I've just been called into the me a meeting for the next hour. Do you mind if I leave you on your own? Uh, so the big sigh of relief, uh, yeah, it's absolutely fine, not a problem whatsoever. So now I've got full access to their network for an hour, and now all I have to do is use that access to find this information stored on there, the, the blueprints, the designs for the drugs. It takes me about 45 minutes, and I do find these, these designs. Uh, brilliant, I found them. Um, I put them onto an encrypted, very, very strong military encryption uh, USB stick, um, take them off, uh, and then leave the building. Um, so that's part one is, is successful now. I've, I've broken onto the computer network, I've broken into the building, I've gone to their computer network, I've used the username and password that I got from the phishing attack to log on and steal the information uh, that I wanted to. So really happy, I, I've got through that first stage successfully, I've not been caught, no one's raised any suspicions, um, so away I go. Uh, so first part successful. Second part is the head office. Now, if you remember earlier, as I explained, the head office is really secure. It's big fences, CCTV cameras. I think they had dog patrols going around there, and probably motion sensors. So, you know, I can't really, I can't really break in um, just dressed as as Dave from the telecoms company. You know, I need to come up with something a bit more, just, uh, a bit more robust. Also, can't just kind of kind of sneak in um, and pretend to, you know, or jump over the fences or anything like that. That's not going to work. It's too secure. So we need to come up with a bit more of a, a better pretext, a way of breaking in. Uh, and there are a couple of things we do. So there's a few ideas. First one, perhaps we could pretend to be a job applicant and get an interview there. Now, interview can work really, really well. Uh, and then you, when, once you're in the interview, you say you need the toilet and use that time to break away. The only problem is you can't really dictate when you're going to get the interview or whether you're going to get the interview. And also, obviously, when you're in there, unless you know the subject, you're going to look, look like an absolute idiot. And I've been to a couple of interviews where I've learned a few things to make me seem like I, I knew what I was doing. Got found out in about five minutes, had to sort of star my way out of it. Um, so it's not an ideal one. Another idea, a courier. So you go in, deliver a parcel, and then ask you to use the toilet. Um, but often at high secure buildings, they have specific delivery points for courier parcels. Um, and you can't use that one because you just give up your parcel and then you say, can you use the toilet? And they say no, and then you're done. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Um, another one we could do is some sort of interview uh, or research for a newspaper or journal to do with the pharmaceutical industry. That's quite a good one, works quite well. Uh, maybe a tour of the premises. We pretend to be from a school and we're, we're teachers going in to do a uh, sort of suss it out and see whether it'd be good for a school tour. Again, they can just say no though, so it doesn't really work brilliantly. Um, two that we do narrow it down to, number one, tour of the premises as a prospective customer. So someone that might want to use some of their labs, they do lots of work for other companies, we might want to hire out their staff to do some work for us. So maybe we can get a tour. Second one, uh, interview for a magazine. Um, so we identified that this company did something called corporate social responsibility, where they, they do charity work for companies. Now, lots of big companies will do this. They'll go and paint a wall for a local charity or something like that. And then they'll post about it on their, on their social media because it's good advertising and also it's a very nice thing to do. The good thing about that is companies are very keen to talk about it because it's good, good marketing. It seems like a nice thing to do. Uh, so first thing, we investigate the, the tour idea. Um, so we, we register a website address. We send some emails into the company to start chatting about uh, the tour. Um, but we decide it's not that good an idea. Um, certain things they can just say no to. They might not give us access. They might follow us around the whole time. Um, so we decide that's probably not the best idea. What we go back to is the idea for a charity magazine. Uh, so we register a fake charity website. We start getting a social media following as well. Um, we still have this this uh, company, this fake magazine that we have you know, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of followers now. We publish articles for it every month and things like that. Um, we, we maintain it as sort of like a, a legend, a bit like MI5 do, but a little bit less uh, intense. Um, so we maintain this as a, as a legend um, and we use this. We email the company. Um, and say, we, we, we saw the great charity work you did recently. We would love to um, interview you about this charity work that you've done. What do you think? Would this be okay? So we send them that, into the, that email. Uh, they come back and say, yes, would you like to come in for an interview at our head office on this date? Absolutely brilliant. So they've got this brilliant exterior security. They've got these fences, these CCTV cameras, these dog patrols, security 
safety patrols, etc. None of it matters now because we've just sent in an email from a fake magazine. We've been invited in the front door. Now all we have to do is break away from this interview uh, and get access to the laboratories unaccompanied. Um, now that's kind of easier said than done. We know from we've been told that this company have a po company policy that all visitors have to be accompanied at all times. It's a really good way of stopping people pretending to be someone else getting into the office and then just wandering off uh, because they should be accompanied because they're not a real employee, they're a visitor and whoever's in charge of them should be accompanying them. So we're gonna have to try and somehow bypass that policy, which is where the social engineering, the human hacking element comes into it. Um, so I don't wanna do this part because I was went to the branch office and I've already been exposed, my face has been seen. I don't wanna risk this part. So we send in two different people. So Anne is not a real name, but that's the actress who we use. Uh, and George is one of the team uh, that works with me um, on, on this, this side of the business. Um, so they arrive for the, for the press interview, they're given visitor passes and things like that and escorted to, to a room. Um, now, I can't remember quite exactly what this um, says on the screen. I think it's actually slightly different to what really happened. I'll tell you what really happened. Um, so George is a bit of a devious guy. Um, he decides what he's gonna do. He's gonna go to the local chemist just before the test. He's gonna buy a packet of Imodium. Now, the Imodium is diarrhea medicine, if you don't know what that is, the sort of thing you take when you, when you think everything's gonna go wrong. Uh, so you take, he takes that in and he puts it on the table right at the start of the interview. It's a really crude way of doing it, but it works, an absolute charm. Uh, and he says, um, look, I'm really sorry, but I've had a bit of a dodgy curry last night. Um, I think, I think you know, I might have to get up and go to the bathroom. It's, I'm really sorry, but just, you know, if I get up and go, you know, I'll be fine. Um, so they get about five, 10 minutes into the, to the interview and he starts groaning. Now, whenever we're doing these tests, uh, we, we use hidden cameras to, to record what we're doing. So we've got uh, cameras hidden in the, in the buttons of shirts. Um, we've got them in glasses. Uh, we've got them in the pattern of a tie, in the lid of a coffee cup. They're brilliant, you can't see them. Um, so he's, he's using one of those. Um, and you see on the camera, they, they're looking a bit like, disgusted at him because he's coughing away and then he's he's making news he's groaning but again another five minute in five minutes in and he gets up he stands up and he sprints out of the room absolutely sprints out of that room uh, and you see on the camera the other people get up knowing they're supposed to go with him uh, and then sit back down again and go and shake their heads like you're not going to go with that guy are you the guy that's rushing off because he's got diarrhea you're not going to go with him so they lead him to it and that's like i said it's crude but it works, we bypass that company policy. They know they're supposed to accompany him, but they don't want to. So it's kind of worked. You know, it's not the most nice thing in the world, but it's worked really, really well. Now, once he's outside that room, he's wearing a visitor badge, um, but we know from doing the reconnaissance, the only difference between a visitor badge and an employee badge is the color of the lanyard that's been, been worn. Uh, so he's got a different lanyard color. I think it's blue rather than red. Um, so I've given him the other color. So as soon as he's out of the room, he switches out the lanyards. Now the head office has a few hundred people working there. So you're inside, you're unaccompanied, you're wearing the right color lanyard, you are an employee, effectively. There's too many people for everyone to know everyone, there's too many people coming and going, so you are trusted. The other mistake the company made is once you're inside, you were trusted because you were, um, you were inside wearing the right badge, et cetera. So they didn't have locks internally. They didn't have swipe card access once you were inside. Um, so you could roam around freely within this area, which meant you could gain access to laboratories, only certain ones, obviously the ones that are, you know, controlling certain substances and things like that, you'd have to go through airlocks and stuff like that. But certain labs, especially ones that were just sort of computer labs, would be free access and you could walk in and stuff. And they were generally unused as well a lot of the time, there weren't people in there. Uh, so George wandered around quite freely. Um, he went into some laboratories, he took some nice selfies of him next to uh, various things he wasn't supposed to be next to. Uh, he sat down at a computer. Now, George isn't very computer literate, um, but I'd given him a USB stick that he could plug in. Now, what this USB stick does is it pretends to be a keyboard. Uh, it sounds a bit random, but you plug it in. You know when you plug in a keyboard, it starts working, you can type on it. This thing plugs in a key, pretends to be a keyboard, and it starts typing itself, effectively. It pretends to be a keyboard, and it sends a whole stream of commands. So it presses the start button. It opens up the start menu. It types in CMD or PowerShell so it can load up this command prompt window that you can start typing things into and then starts typing commands in one by one, pressing enter as if someone's typing it. And it, you can use that to send all these commands to it that allows us to gain access to that computer. You send a request to another computer somewhere else in the world, allowing access 
to that computer that we plug this fake keyboard into. So we plug in that and we use that to access that computer remotely. And he's recording this all on video. You can see it popping up and all the commands typing in and then it disappearing again uh, without a trace. So now we've got complete access to this computer. And he wanders around for another few minutes. He goes into different labs. He, you know, he says hello to people as if he works there. That's a lot of what social engineering is. You pretend to be someone, you, you act like that person, you act relaxed. Um, and then he goes back into the interview they carry on the interview, then uh, Anne has prepared a full hour's worth of interview questions. You know, proper, she's properly researched this charity um, that she's supposedly um, talking about. Uh, I think it's a uh, sort of brain charity. Um, so they, they researched that, prepared all these interview questions, and then they finished off uh, and they left the building. And the company literally had no idea, no idea whatsoever that we'd been there, uh, that this interview wasn't legitimate, that we'd been into the building at all. They kept asking us, how's the red team going? We wouldn't, you know, we'd tell them, you know, it was going ongoing. Uh, and then we finished it up and we sent them the video footage. And they were just like, how did you do that? How on earth? We'd, uh, we'd have had no idea. If that was a real criminal attack, you'd have had access to these blueprints for our drugs that are worth millions to us. Um, and we wouldn't have any idea until they appeared on the black market. And we, we wouldn't have a clue. We wouldn't know how to, to find out that had happened. Um, so from our point of view, really, really successful. We got in, we broke in, we showed them how it's done. And the key point to this is the lessons and the report that we send them. So the follow-up is, is several stages. It's a, a phone call initially to tell them what happened and how it worked. It's followed up by a, a PDF report telling them everything that we did, detailing some screenshots, how we planned it, how we executed it, all the research we found, all the images we found online they should take off, um, the plans we came up with, the failings uh, that they did, and these lessons they learned. So first thing, we gained access to someone's password by sending them a phishing attack. The staff were not well trained enough to recognize that as a phishing attack. So they needed staff awareness training. They needed someone like me to come in and say to them, look, these are what we do. This is how we do it. This is from my own experience. It's not something I'm reading from a textbook. It's not me just saying, don't click on this link. Don't do that. It's me saying, this is how it works. This is how we broke in. Um, this is the video footage of what we did after that because of this password. Um, so that's the first thing. It's staff awareness training. And that is the, honestly, that's the key to defending companies nowadays. The key one to defending against cyber attacks is awareness training for your staff because they're nearly always the ones that make the mistake. Um, it's uh, processes and procedures were not followed or were not robust enough. So yes, when I got to that branch office reception, she, she said you can't come in. She then though gave me the phone number and accepted an incoming phone call um, from someone she didn't know and accepted that person as Adam because the story kind of fit. Um, but actually it was just one of the guys in my office phoning up and pretending. Um, I was then allowed access to the computer network and the IT person went away and didn't, didn't accompany me. Um, we have insufficient um, visitor procedures at the head office as well. So although they had the procedure that all visitors have to be accompanied, they didn't follow it. At the end of the day, okay, yeah, it was a good ploy that using that emoji to, to get away from that, that lecture, that, um, that interview, but they should have followed it. They had a procedure, they didn't follow that procedure, and therefore they got they got hacked. And that's a lot of it. If you have robust procedures, people have got to follow it. And again, that comes back to training. You know, whatever someone says to you, you, you don't believe it, you, you follow the procedure. Um, internally, they had problems in the head office. They allowed you to access laboratories, computers, all that sort of thing without having to swipe in again without providing that extra layer that's upgraded now you go back to that office now it's biometric scanners fingerprints all around the office um it's id badges that have to be displayed at all times that are significantly different to the visitor badge with holograms things you can't create easily <coughs> uh, they didn't have a culture of challenging people that weren't recognized and now they do now we i have been around and trained all their staff have shown them the videos uh, now they have a culture it's a friendly culture but it's 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 been nice, but challenge. Um, uh, and last one is they had um, their sensitive information, those blueprints, those designs were only protected by the password of someone that just supplied it into uh, a message. Um, so, you know, it's not enough. If you're talking about your crown jewels, they should be protected with an extra layer, whether it's an extra application that they're stored within that has encryption, uh, whether it's encrypted at rest with an extra password that no, that hardly anyone knows, it's got to be protected better than it was uh, on that computer network. Um, so I hope that's given you a good sort of briefing on, on how we do this stuff. I, you know, I could go into this for hours. I'd love to tell you more stories and maybe maybe another time I can come back and tell you some more stories of, of places I've broken into. Um, but the idea behind red teaming is you, you 
you find out your company, you think about who might actually target you. You know, is it criminal gangs? Is it foreign intelligence services? Is it activist groups? Is it someone inside of the company that might do it? You find out what sort of technical skill level they have. You contract a company like mine, like Phalanx, to, to break into that company um, and, uh, and find a way in. Um, you, you ask them what methods would be used and then we simulate those real methods. Uh, you give us an objective, you find out, you think about what your crown jewels are, your most important things. You tell us what those are, we break in, we try and get them. We then check your preventative controls, which means the things that prevent us from getting in, but also your detective controls. Did you have any idea that attack had happened? And the company I was talking about, like I said, they had no idea. So their computer systems weren't set up to detect that someone was using an account in a weird way, had used a phishing attack and things like that. So they learned from that. They put defensive mechanisms in detective controls, manage detection and response. That's something else that Phalanx does. You, know, you, you look for weird things going on in the network. You know, someone's logged in from Singapore, now they've logged in from London 10 minutes later. That's impossible. So you know that and you flag that up. Little things like that. You do this, you do it again, uh, you learn lessons, you change things, you repeat it, you do it again six months later and you just keep repeating until you are able to defend against even the most sophisticated criminal attacks. And that's why red teaming is such a good way of, of protecting companies. Um, now that pretty much brings me on to the, the 45 minutes of presentation. Um, before I go on to questions, just got my contact information up there. Um, so we do offer this service, we offer security awareness training. I'm not here to sell you stuff. Um, if you just want to email me, ask questions, you're interested in the job, you're interested in having a chat, you've got my email address there, you won't go out fishing me, you've got my email address there. Um, it's a website address, you've got my Twitter. Um, my Twitter is open to the world, ironically, even though obviously most of the time I would advise people not to do that. I have to for, for, for media work. But you've got my contact details there. Um, and that is it, it's 45 minutes. Um, Susanna, have we got any questions? Amazing, oh my goodness, we do have so many questions, so, so, so many. So um, thank you so much, Rob, for um, having you. It has been absolutely amazing so far. So I will hit you with the first questions and I will take them as they come. Okay. So the first one, uh, because it's going to go uh, align with, with your video presentation. So Richard Benjamin um, uh, has asked, do you also fix the exposure problems for the companies that you break into? So if you want to, I can I can switch on, uh, I can switch on, um, Richard, to discuss that more with you, if you would like, or do you want to just comment? Sure, I'll just comment first, and then feel free to unmute him uh, at the same time. But I'll, I'll answer the question, okay. then if it's not what you meant, Richard, we can discuss further. So the exposure points. So what we do is um, we we show them everything we found. So in terms of all the research as well as the actual execution of the attack, we walk them through it. We show them every website that we found information on them, every social media profile. We, we screenshot all the images and, and give that to them and tell them where they can go to shut those down and how to do it. Um, but we don't actually do it ourselves. So we won't go in and fix things for them. We won't go fix their IT systems. And the reason for that is to have a separation. Um, if we are mm -hmm. fixing things as well, we're very incentivized to find those problems and then you know, we find the problem and then here's our magic solution that fixes it all that costs hundred thousand pounds a year it doesn't make you very independent uh, it doesn't make you very ethical so we kind of we always keep that separation between the fixing and the, the and the testing um i don't know i'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean but hopefully that's answered the question Richard, yeah i think so I that's to... um that was really good uh, oh, oh thank you, you hear me all right yeah yeah i did yeah but yeah thank you yeah, so right. no, I think you want to kind of answer the question a little bit um, in the presentation anyway, but um, I think that, that really does make sense. Um, I would I would think that, um, you know, being the person that, that or the, the company that finds the problems and then and then uh, subsequently is the one that fixes them. It's a bit of a conflict of interest, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 basically about like being a pharmaceutical company that invents the the illness and then invents the drug. It's kind of that sort of scenario. So, so yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Question? Well, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Richard. Thank you, Richard. So the next question is from Ben Armstrong. So a lot of companies are now utilizing the cloud storage. Do you have any experience of carrying out your work at remote cloud storage sites? And I will unmute Ben if he is still here. I will unmute him. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of two parts to that question. So firstly, cloud storage, depending on how it's implemented, can be really good. But what it does do is by its nature, it tends to be accessible from anywhere in the world to anyone. 
most companies won't lock it down by particular IP addresses or anything. Um, so you can, you know, if you can get hold of the username and password, you can potentially log into it. So the same sort of phishing scenario I did in this one, you get a password, you log into the cloud storage, now you have access to everything, you don't even have to break into the building. But if it does have multi-factor authentication, so that extra code you have to put in, it becomes a lot more difficult to do and, and to the point where you probably wouldn't do it. In terms of the actual, where the data is stored, so the sort of the data centers that, that store the stuff, Yes, I have broken into data centers, not anything like AWS or, or Azure or anything like that, but I've done smaller data centers. They're, they're probably the hardest target I've come up against. I've done military installations as well, uh, and data centers are often more difficult, um, especially the good ones. They're, they're like jails. You, you cannot get in without a legitimate appointment. You can't just show up. You've got to, the only way I found it to work is to get a tour of the building as a prospective customer and then try and break away. But they're so well locked down. They tend to be within individual cages. You get followed around. Even when you go to the toilet, you get followed around. So they're, they're really good. Data centers are, from my experience, are probably the hardest target. Um, so I've had very, very limited success in breaking into to data centers in terms of the actual where the cloud physically stores that data on, on, on computers. I'm unmuted, Ben. So if you, Ben, wants to just comment back or you're happy with the answer, please feel free. Um, if not, I just think we're going to go to the next question. Sure. Um, so the next one is from uh, Dan Millen. So he's asking about the OVA. So yeah. could you please explain a little more about what vulnerabilities exist? My employer uses OVA. What, what, sorry, what, that question, which, what empl why employees, employers use OVA? Could you please explain a little more about what vulnerabilities exist? Yeah that um, okay, his yeah. employer is using of us so i'm just going to switch on dan millen if he's still here sure. I will okay just... so so i wear itself and more modern outlook 365 there's not any particular issues with the technology itself and how it works there's no like glaring vulnerabilities in the in the way it's written or anything like that where the vulnerability lies is when companies use it um without requiring two-factor authentication so that means putting that extra code in um, so what we can do is that we can then do those phishing attacks we can clone or copy that interface send an email that looks like it's come from the IT department asking someone to log into a very similar looking address uh, and then you steal the password from there um, so by having OWA remotely accessible I can now log into that account and access their emails but also in the case of like in this story all I did was use it as a um, like an a, a excuse to email them around really. Um, they knew, the company knew they could log into their emails remotely using OWA, um, so they did. So when I sent out an email saying it's being upgraded, they then just followed that and they clicked on that and they put their password in because they used to put their password into that site. So I was able to use that to, to do that phishing attack, which got me the password, which I then just deployed when I broke into the office. So OWA itself, if it's deployed with multi-factor authentication, it is actually quite good, but you've got to combine it with staff awareness training as well to make people aware of what phishing attacks are out there that, that tend to copy these interfaces because it's one of the most common ones to copy is to, especially Outlook 365, it's like the most common thing that you copy uh, if you're trying to, to hack a company by a phishing attack. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, hopefully. Yeah, that's great. The, the, the comment about two-factor authentication, I think is, is a good one and something I'll be bringing up at work. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant actually. Um, if I see a company's using two-factor, I probably won't bother trying to break in through that interface directly um, because it's really complicated if you want to do that. You've got to come up with some really complicated attacks. You might even have to steal their mobile phone and stuff, which isn't beyond the realms of a red team exercise. Um, it's, you know, it has to be a corporate phone. I don't want to steal pers people's personal phones. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it works really, really well. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so the next question, if that is okay with you, Dan, we will move yeah. to John Mitchell. So he's having the uh, he's having the question, what letter of comfort did you get from the company before starting your work? Yeah, um, so I'm just gonna, sorry, I'm gonna be a bit rude. As I'm answering, I'm gonna move and plug you in because I'm about to run out of battery and the last thing I wanna do is completely disappear before we finish. Um, so I'm just gonna walk around the room. You'll probably see my cats as I'm walking around. Um, so what level of authority? So what we do is we get the companies to sign what we call a consent form or a letter of authority. So that is a document 
full of legal wording that I don't really understand uh, that allows us to basically uh, break onto their network without exposing us to legal risk, basically. Um, I don't want to expose myself when I'm plugging this uh, thing in. Um, so we need to make sure that's signed because if we don't have a consent form, we are just breaking the law. Um, two seconds. That's it. I'll show you my stomach. Apologies. Uh, there we go. Happy days. Um, so yeah, we are. We have to make sure we have that form. Otherwise, we're breaking the Computer Misuse Act uh, and various other laws. Um, without that form, we are. We can go to jail. Um, so we have to get that form signed, and a test will never ever proceed without that form being signed. Um, and we carry that round with us at all times during the test. So if we're caught and we can't talk our way out of it, we'll reveal that consent form, and it's signed by someone senior in the company. Uh, and they will have a contact number on there. They can phone up and check that it's a legitimate test. So that's how the that's how the authority works. Can I come back there, Rob? Yeah, of course you can. Um, you produce you you get caught. You produce your letter of authority, and people say, "Well, you could have faked that as well." Yeah. And actually, we do do that as well. So I will carry around a fake one with me because that's quite a good way of doing it. Um, so yeah, so the real one, um, it has a contact number on there and it will be someone that works for that company. Uh, so they can phone them up and they can check with that. So it'll normally be someone very senior in the IT team or the CISO or the CEO, someone like that. So they can phone them up and they can speak to them. I can physically go and see them. Often what happens is they take me with them to go and see that person and then they legitimize that it's a test. Uh, it's very rare for me to get caught. It's only happened a couple of times. Um, but when it does, that's normally the approach that, that's taken. Um, I do have a slight nightmare at some point that someone's going to um, trick me into doing a social engineering test for a company they don't actually work for and sign the form off and everything. And I do all my due diligence, but they still didn't work there. They just maybe break into a company. Um, but I, I think that's probably hopefully not going to happen. But yeah, that, that's how they check. It's legitimate. They just go and walk over to the person and, and check with them. OK, thanks, Rob. No worries. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Ranjan. Hi, Ranjan. Um, he's asking about the social engineering that it seems to be very powerful, the way mm. how to hack in the organization. And he's saying, is there any way that they can actually proactively stop this by educating support staff like front desk executive? Or what is your opinion how these things can be done? Yeah, or yeah, more so mitigated? Sorry, um, as I said a couple of times in that presentation, it's it's all about um, awareness training. So what I do when I go in is I try and encourage companies to to uh, let me do the, the physical intrusion of their building so I can record it all on hidden cameras, to let me do a phishing attack so I can show them how that's done. And then I do a training session a bit like this, um, but with more sort of a bit longer with more educational pieces on, you know, this is how you look, spot phishing attacks and stuff like that. This is how you choose a good password, that sort of thing. Uh, and we train them up, but you make it really interesting. So I hope people have enjoyed this presentation. I, I love telling stories. Uh, and that's how I do it when I go into companies. So, you know, at the moment we're all restricted in where we can go. So I've been delivering my, my training via video link. Um, but, but normally what I'll do is I'll go in face to face and I'll chat to companies and I'll tell them stories. I'll show them the video of us breaking into their building. And that has so much more impact than someone from your IT team going, you know, don't click on this link. You have, you have to have this password of this length. If you, if you tell the story behind it, you tell it from the hacker's perspective with real anecdotes that person has done themselves. It is such a powerful way of learning. Uh, and I'm really sort of passionate about it. Um, and it works really, really well. And I've, I've had loads of good feedback from companies saying that's actually you know, prevented cyber attacks um, from hitting them that they, they think would have done otherwise. So it's all about training. All right. So thank you for that. Next one is um, related to, to what extent can companies police what their staff are putting on social media in order to protect themselves? So generally what the company can say to the people, what they could and shouldn't put on social media to what extent? Yeah. That's from okay, Sheila. So okay, thank you. Thanks for that question. So that, that links very neatly back to the previous question, actually. Again, it's about education. So you can't force your staff and how they use their personal social media. Obviously you can ban them using it during work time, but in their own time, they're still gonna post stuff about work. You can't prevent that. Um, because that's their accounts. You can control your corporate social media accounts, of course, but personal ones uh, becomes a lot more difficult. And that becomes again about education. Um, and what I do when I present to, to staff is I try and make it as personal as possible. So I talk about the risk to their own personal life of revealing information uh, about themselves and about where they work, about not using the privacy settings. 
Um, and, and that kind of tends to get people a lot more than talking just about their work life. You make them care about their own personal security, and then they tend to care about work security as a sort of byproduct of that. Um, so you teach them the ways to secure their social media profiles. You tell them the sort of stuff they shouldn't be using. You know, sometimes companies will ask me to research some of their employees and put those images into the slides to not really embarrass people, but just to show how easy it is to do it. Um, and then you show that off and you say to people, look, this is how easy it was for me to gather all these, this information about people. Look, here's an ID badge. Uh, here's all sorts of other things that we found. Uh, and you educate them. Again, you, you show them why it's important, why they should care about it. And then hopefully they, they then start really caring about it. Again, it's not just telling them you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. It's, it's illustrating why, why information on social media can be used for phishing attacks, how you build up that that path um, to, to a full on cyber attack. And that's what makes it a lot more uh, applicable to people. I can see that uh, Vidya Panchanathan, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, said that a company can have their social media policy and part of internal audits um, can assess and report on compliance and effectiveness on the policy. So I think it's just a uh, comment back. Yeah, that's a that's a good answer as well. Actually, yeah, I didn't think about the the policy side of it. Again, I don't know how you'd enforce personal um, social media. I suppose you could say you can't post about work, but whether you could enforce people to use privacy settings and things, I don't know. It's an interesting question, but it's probably someone for a compliance more compliancy than me. Um, but it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, it's a I work for quite a big organisation, so that this is a big problem. If you're quite a small company you could effectively police things like LinkedIn because you're only dealing with a few people. Yeah. But my organization is about 40,000 strong. Right, um, okay. But no, I, I, I think what you say is very, very important. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. It's, it's education, like I said. And it, just a quick side on that, it's not just e-learning. A lot of companies just rely on e-learning and say, you know, this is our social media policy, is a video of why it's important. No one watches those things, no one cares. Get, get them all in a room to listen to someone that's telling stories, it, it works a lot better. And I can, I can grant it because we have done work with Rob previously and it does have a very, very good effect on the people, believe it or not. Even on those who are already used and they are technical, they will be like, oh my goodness, like there are always things to learn. So quickly on the next uh, question, are you still having time, Rob? Can you dedicate more, a few more minutes? Yeah, I've got about five, ten minutes. So yeah, yeah still okay. Time. So quickly, um, the Philip is asking if the company had SOC, if you know that the company which you break in, if they had SOC? They had a SOC. Uh, no, they didn't have a SOC uh, at the time. They do now. Um, but no, they didn't have a SOC at, at the time. So they had no, they basically had no detection systems in place on their on their network. Some of the techniques I used probably would have been picked up by a SOC because I had to do it quite quickly. And um, we do have other techniques we can use to, to bypass. Okay, I'm just going to skip everybody to talk back because we are short on, on time of Rob, so we will just go through the question quickly. So sorry for not allowing you guys to uh, speak back. So the next one is, if you are caught red-handed, do you inform the staff who you are and that the test is over? That's from Darren. So literally, if you are caught red-handed that you do what you do, do you inform the staff who you are and that the test is over, I think, in the end or something? Um, hold on, hold on, Rob. I don't think so. We hear you. Sorry, you have been on mute. I'm mute. Cool. Okay, I'm unmuted. So if I get caught, does it end the test, I think you said? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, Sometimes. Um, so basically how, how it works is if we agree up front what will happen if we get caught and then what the actions that want to be take, take place after that. So oftentimes um, they'll let us carry on and target a different building or something like that. It depends whether they they want to choose it like a real criminal attack and then they sort of they catch us and then they, they let their instant response process kick in uh, and see what happens there. Um, usually um, they let us carry on and they sort of say, we caught you here, we'll write down where we caught you, carry on, see how far else you can get. And we can use that then to find out other other risks that we might not have found if we just stopped at that point. But we note down in the report they caught us at this point and that you know, in real life that wouldn't have had as much of an effect. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one is how many environments that you have studied suffer from the high I am an IT person, which grants instant access to everything? Uh, so yes, yeah, so kind of like a, 
Okay, so kind of so when you log on, you get access to, to everything. Um, so what we call a kind of a flat network, I suppose. Uh, yeah, you get that quite often actually. Um, and often the the only thing protecting data is Active Directory credentials. So the, the accounts that you log on to on Windows is often the only thing protecting it. And it's usually shared across SharePoint and, and all those sorts of things. So once you get those passwords, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, what you eventually want, uh, without getting too technical, is what's called a domain admin, which is like the, ho the highest level of, of user or the top level user in the company. Uh, and they can access any computer at any time and do anything with it. And there are various techniques, uh, cyber attack techniques, and I won't take me ages to go into them, but allow you to gain access to a domain admin account. And then you have the keys to the domain. And then it's just a matter of finding the information. It's just the, the time it takes to find the information that's the target of the test. Cool. Now it's going to be pretty quick because Paul is asking, are you open to collaboration with other IT companies? I think it's either yes uh, or yeah. no. Yeah, 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 it does. Yeah, we work with other IT companies in terms of um, offering different services and um, sort of selling security services through managed service providers and things. So, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just drop me an email. Um, the next one is, would not the CCTV in the head office capture George Acts? It's from Chanuka de Alves, so. Uh, yeah, so the CCTV would have caught Alan George going in. I don't believe there was internal CCTV. I think it was just pointed externally. So yes, it would have it would have caught them going in. So if you if you'd known that incident had occurred, you could go back and potentially see who it was that had broken in. But then finding them afterwards would have been, you know, it's a proper police investigation. And, and at that point, it depends how sophisticated the criminal group is. But yes, their faces would have been seen on CCTV as they came into the building. Um, we can mitigate that somewhat by the recon phase, working out where the CCTV cameras are and trying to uh, avoid them or, or shielding your face at the point where you walk past the camera and things. Um, so if you're a real criminal group, you might go to a few extra steps. Uh, but yeah, they, they could have investigated afterwards and found that those images, yes. The next one is when you were talking about open surveillance and intelligence gathering, I have heard that um, there are specific search engines that you can use to quickly gather social media information. Do you use any of these? Um, uh, do, do you use these and how do they compare to Google, Clifford Diamond? Yeah, yes, yeah, so we do use some tools. Um, personally, I find a lot of the tools don't work that well. So. If you went back a little while, there were lots of tools that, you, that could access social media accounts and search through them and things. But the, the social media companies, especially Facebook, have changed what their, their APIs, the things that, that, you, that allow you to connect into their website to query it for information. And they've locked them off and you can't use those tools anymore. Um, so most of those things don't work anymore. And it's a manual effort to go through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. There are certain things that help out a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's mostly uh, manual effort, to be honest. There are, there are some tools that we use, there's a tool called The Harvester that I use. Um, there's another one that the name, Multigo uh, is another one that's a, a paid for tool that we use that, that gathers information about companies. But generally speaking, they don't work very well on social media and social media is the best form of information. So it's, it's a big manual effort most of the time to, 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 to go through, trawl through that information. It's quite fun though, it's like, like kind of, uh, it's been nosy, really. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one more uh, similar to that from the from Thomas Arnold. Wouldn't it have been less riskier to break into the systems without physically be in the building? Isn't that the higher risk nowadays? Uh, yeah, yeah, it probably would have been less risky uh, to, to not go in physically. The reason we went in physically is because we've got a very good team that do that really, really good, um, hardly ever caught. Um, and when you're inside, um, you get access to a bit more information. So if I'd wanted to stay remotely, all I could have done was log in through the Outlook web app. Now that would have got me access to emails, but I really needed access to the actual files that were stored in the system. Now, in order to access those remotely, I'd need access to either a SharePoint system that was accessible remotely, which most aren't or are protected by multi-factor, or I would need some sort of VPN level access, an SSL VPN or something like that. A lot of companies don't use those anymore or they're protected by multi-factor authentication again. Um, so in this case, I didn't have a VPN that I could connect through. So the only thing I could have accessed was the emails. So I needed to get physical access in order to actually get onto the computer network that would allow me to access those files. All right, um, we do have so many questions. So I'm so sorry for a lot of people who will not get <laughs> answered, but I'm conscious of, of, of your time. Um, I think one of the interesting one in here is if you want to hire someone to be in your team, 
what sort of qualification experience you will be looking for. I think you may have some fans. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so uh, most people start off on the technical side, so they learn cyber attacks and mostly web applications and infrastructure. Um, and you start off, there's a couple of ways into it. Um, you can either self-study and do various exams and things. So there's uh, there's lots of resources like Cybrary, C-Y-B-R-A-R-Y, um, where you can learn stuff. You can then take courses like the OSCP, the Offensive Security Certified Professional course, which is really, really well regarded. And then you can just basically hammer your CV out to companies and hope that they'll give you a shot. Or nowadays you can go through university and you can get ethical hacking degrees and then you can go from there. Now from there, if you want to get into the red teaming side, it requires a lot of experience. So you're probably looking at least a couple of years, probably more than that of experience of doing the, the other bits and pieces and an aptitude for social engineering. Now only certain personality types can do that because you've got to You've got to pretend to be someone else. You've got to uh, not be flustered in 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 the face of um, you know potentially someone trying to find out who you are, and, and and you know you don't want to give away who you are and just go in and start giggling or anything like that. Um, so you have to have an aptitude for that, and, and you you kind of get you, you you go along with it. you kind of go on a ride along with with the people that do it and, and work out whether you'd be any good at it. Uh, but yeah, basically, it's degree or self study, and then and then apply and hope you you looking you find a company that's uh, willing to take a shot on you. Um, but it's a good industry to be in, really good industry to be in at the moment. Um, yeah, there is a lot of lot of questions related, guys, about uh, you know how to get to the to the red teaming, also about your experience, what you did, and so on and so on. So I think you have answered that all together. So I think um, there are a lot of technical and other questions, but I'm just conscious that we are ten minutes over the time which you promise us. So um, I would like to okay. just, on the behalf of the Irma and whole British uh, Computer Society, to thank you so much, Rob, for having us. Uh, we will be providing as a token of appreciation uh, a book to Rob. So we will do that, of course, in in in, in line with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, remotely or device now, I would be giving you hug and book if they would be face to face. <laughs> and I wanted to thank everybody um, uh, who came in here uh, and participate on this event. I believe it has been success. I'm sorry if we haven't asked all the questions. Um, if there is anything, please do contact us on the events at Irma. We can pass it on on Rob, or if you would like to discuss it something, we are absolutely open. And we will look forward to welcome you on the next event. And I would also hope that those events will somehow initiate that you would be interested to become a member of the British Computer Society, which we would really much like. So we do run these events every month, every second Tuesday. So if you do follow us on the on the even bright and uh, other also um, special groups, you will get a notification. So thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, thank Great you, email. everybody. Cool. Thanks. Feel free to email me questions if you didn't get answered. Absolutely fine. Thank you, Rob, for that, and wish you everybody keep safe and sane if you if you can. Thank yeah, you, everyone. Yeah, Closing Bye. the recording. Bye. Thank you.